Good morning, and again, happy 4th of July. This morning, uh, Pastor Randy Owens is ill and not, be, and not able to be with us, so we welcome Pastor Bryce from the Church of the Nazarene for our invocation. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you this morning that we can celebrate the fact that we have freedom here in this country. Lord, we'd, we'd ask that you would be with those families this morning who are reminded of their loss of a loved one that served in the military and that you would be a comforter for them. And Lord, we'd ask that you would put a blessing of protection on those military men and women who are currently and actively defending our freedoms. Lord, we thank you for them and their sacrifice to our country. Lord, we were also reminded of some of those in our communities who are hurting this morning. We'd ask that you would bring peace and blessing to them. And Lord, we'd ask that you would bless us with this service this morning. Pray all these things in your holy and gracious name. Amen. Amen. So let me introduce myself. My name is Margaret Scherzinger, and I'm the Vice President of the Friends of the Working Men's Institute. On behalf of the Friends, I welcome you to our annual Independence Day celebration. This tradition began over 200 years ago when the community would gather to sing patriotic songs, listen to the reading of the Declaration of Independence, and welcome a keynote speaker. The celebration then continued with a picnic and free beer brewed by the Harmony Society. <laughs> Today, as we gather to enjoy many of the same uh, festivities, there are a couple of exceptions. A golf cart parade has been added, and root beer has replaced the traditional harmonist <laughs> beer at the picnic. Sorry. <laughs> as, we begin the, as we begin our celebration, let's rise as American Legion Post 370 presents our colors. to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. And now, we, I introduce the New Harmony Community Choir under the direction of Tina Schutte. Our first selection is a salute to the armed forces. And as always, we ask that when we sing the anthem for your particular branch of service, that you would rise and let us work the English. United States of America. 
And now, please welcome New Harmony resident, Mr. Tom Stahl, as he reads the Declaration of Independence. In Congress, July 4th, 1776, the unanimous Declaration of the 13 United States of America. When in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitle them. A decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to the separation. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed, that whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it and to institute new government, laying its foundation on such principles and organizing its powers in such form as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. Prudence, indeed, will dictate that governments long established should not be changed for light and transient causes. And accordingly, all experience hath shown that mankind are more disposed to suffer while evils are sufferable than to right themselves by abolishing the forms to which they are accustomed. But when a long train of abuses and usurpations pursuing invariably the same object evinces a design to reduce them under absolute despotism, it is their right, it is their duty to throw off such government and to provide new guards for their future security. Such has been the patient sufferance of these colonies and such is now the necessity which constrains them to alter their former systems of government. The history of the present King of Great Britain, George III, is a history of repeated injuries and usurpations, all having in direct object the establishment of an absolute tyranny over these states. To prove this, let facts be submitted to a candid world. He has refused his assent to laws the most wholesome and necessary for the public good. He has forgotten his governors to pass laws of immediate and pressing importance, unless suspended in their operation until his assent should be obtained, and when so suspended, he has utterly neglected to attend to them. He has refused to pass other laws for the accommodation of large districts of people, unless those people would relinquish the right of representation in the legislature a right inestimable to them and formidable to tyrants only. He has called together legislative bodies at places unusual, uncomfortable, and distant from the depository of their public records for the sole purpose of fatiguing them in the compliance with his measures. He has dissolved representative houses repeatedly for opposing with manly firmness his invasions on the rights of the people. He has refused for a long time after such dissolutions to cause others to be elected, whereby the legislative powers incapable of annihilation have returned to the people at large for their exercise. The state remain, remaining in the meantime exposed to all the dangers of invasion from without and convulsions within. He has endeavored to prevent the population of these states for that purpose, obstructing the laws for naturalization of foreigners refusing to pass others to encourage their migrations hither and raising the conditions of new appropriation of lands. He has obstructed the administration of justice by refusing his assent to laws for establishing judiciary powers. He has made judges dependent on his will alone for the tenure of their offices and the amount and payment of their salaries. He has erected a multitude of new offices and sent hither swarms of officers to harass our people and eat out their substance. He has kept among us in times of peace 
standing armies without the consent of our legislatures. He is affected to render the military independent of and superior to the civil power. He is combined with others to subject us to a jurisdiction foreign to our constitution and unacknowledged by our laws, given his assent to their acts of pretended legislation, for quartering large bodies of armed troops among us, for protecting them by a mock trial from punishment for any murders which they should commit on the inhabitants of these states, for cutting off our trade with all parts of the world, for imposing taxes on us without our consent, for depriving us, in many cases, of the benefits of trial by jury, for transporting us beyond seas to be tried for pretended offenses, for abolishing the free system of English laws in a neighboring province, establishing therein an arbitrary government and enlarging its boundaries so as to render it at once an example and fit instrument for introducing the same absolute rule into these colonies. For taking away our charters, abolishing our most valuable laws, and altering fundamentally the forms of our governments. For suspending our le own legislatures and declaring themselves invested with power to legislate for us in all cases whatsoever. He has abdicated government here by declaring us out of his protection and waging war against us. He has plundered our seas, ravaged our coasts, burnt our towns, and destroyed the lives of our people. He is at this time transporting large armies of foreign mercenaries to complete the works of death, desolation, and tyranny already begun with circumstances of cruelty and perfidy scarcely paralleled in the most barbarous ages and totally unworthy the head of a civilized nation. He has constrained our fellow citizens taken captive on the high seas to bear arms against their country, to become the executioners of their friends and brethren, or to fall themselves by their hands. He has excited domestic insurrections amongst us and has endeavored to bring on the inhabitants of our frontiers, the merciless Indian savages, whose known rule of warfare is an undistinguished destruction of all ages, sexes, and conditions. In every stage of these oppressions, we have petitioned for redress in the most humble terms. <coughs> Our repeated petitions have been answered only by repeated injury. A prince whose character is thus marked by every act which may define a tyrant is unfit to be the ruler of a free people. Nor have we been wanting in attentions to our British brethren. We have warned them from time to time of attempts by their legislature to extend an unwarrantable jurisdiction over us. We've reminded them of the circumstances of our immigration and settlement here. We have appealed to their native justice and magnanimity, and we have, conjured, we have conjured them by the ties of our common kindred to disavow these usurpations, which inevitably interrupt our connections and correspondence. They too have been deaf to the voice of justice and consanguinity. We must therefore acquiesce in the necessity which denounces our separation and hold them as we hold the rest of mankind Enemies in war, in peace, friends. We, therefore, the representatives of the United States of America, in general Congress, assembled, appealing to the supreme judge of the world for the rectitude of our intentions, do, in the name and by the authority of the good people of these colonies, solemnly publish and declare that these United Colonies are, and of right, ought to be free and independent states that they are absolved from all allegiance to the British Crown, and that all political connection between them and the state of Great Britain is and ought to be totally dissolved, and that as free and independent states, they have full power to levy war, conclude peace, contract alliances, establish commerce, and to do all other acts and things which independent states may of right do. And for the support of this declaration, with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor.
And now, please welcome Ms. Dosey Lewis. Good morning. In introducing Kent Schutte, what best describes him? A layered onion, a cat with nine lives, a renaissance man? Patriots come in all stripes. One who has spent a passionate career as an active citizen and steward of America's historic architecture and gardens would no doubt be welcome at the table of Thomas Jefferson. Kent is a former architect, design store founder owner, restaurateur, civic leader, preservationist, professor, gardener, artist, visionary, family man, and tireless volunteer. A native Hoosier born in South Bend, Kent received his BS in architecture at the University of Cincinnati in 1968 and went on to teach design at Ball State School of Architecture for two years before becoming a partner in an architectural practice in Lafayette. Kent served under three governors as the architect member of the Indiana Historic Preservation Review Board, was an advisor to the National Trust, and served on 29 Main Street committees in 12 states. He completed 43 small town revitalization studies in Indiana and Illinois as an urban design and preservation consultant. Kent was also active in Washington, D.C as the Director of General Architecture for the firm HNTB as Project Manager on the Concept Plan to Renovate the Pentagon, and as a Project Architect on the Restoration of the Lincoln and Jefferson Memorials. During his two terms as an elected City Council Member at Large in Lafayette, he spearheaded the Save the Tippecanoe Courthouse and initiated the Railroad Relocation Project. To top this, he was recruited by Purdue University as Professor of Architecture and Historic Preservation in its Landscape Program, where he taught for 45 years. His students could be seen on their annual class trip to New Harmony, where they planted thousands of spring flowers in, thanks to Kent, what is now called the Jane Blaffer Owen Sanctuary. In 1981, he met Jane Owen who in 1996 commissioned him as principal architect for the design of New Harmony Cathedral Labyrinth and Sacred Garden. In 2001, he and his wife Susie purchased a historic home in New Harmony, which they restored and subsequently opened at the Leatherleaf Inn Bed and Breakfast before retiring here full time in 2018. Kent is deeply involved with our community, an active member of Kiwanis, St. Stephen's Episcopal Church, and the Garden Club of New Harmony, his own front garden, puts the rest of ours to shame. He has served on the Robert Lee Blaffer Foundation Board for 10 years and is the chair of its Building and Grounds Committee. He's the current president of the New Harmony Business Associates and director of gardening at the Lens Garden. From 2005 to 2010, he organized and hosted five national symposia in New Harmony creating the League for Cultural Towns. Through his civic and community work, his devotion to teaching, his dedication to historic preservation, and deep knowledge about how to actually get things done, Kent has been Indiana's and New Harmony's own patriotic energizer bunny. I give you my friend, Kent Schutte. Sorry it's so long, but when you have a long life and a lot of stuff in it, that's what happens. Uh, hello to you all. Uh, what a great tradition the celebration of the 4th of July is in New Harmony, Indiana. You guys are great. On a rather cold day in February, uh, February 9th to be exact, I received a letter from the Friends of the Working Man's Institute inviting me to be the keynote speaker for 2022. That seemed a long way off, so I accepted the invitation. <laughs> Time flies by in New Harmony, so here we are, gathered in Murphy Auditorium to celebrate the founding of the great United States of America and our great community, New Harmony, Indiana.
Today is the 246th anniversary of the adoption of the Declaration of Independence on July 4, 1776. 25 years ago, Tom Straw was at this podium and he stated, although this date is considered to be our country's birthday, perhaps we should recognize the event for what it truly was. It was a statement of determination by the leaders of the revolution that they and the people they represented would persevere in the struggle to absolve all allegiance to the British crown and to totally dissolve all political connection to the state of Great Britain. These leaders knew full well the risk they were taking. You may recall that Benjamin Franklin is reported to have commented, we must all hang together or we will most assuredly hang separately. Because of this risk, the sentence immediately above their signatures reads, and for the support of this declaration, with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. Yet it would be seven long and arduous years before the Treaty of Paris was signed and the time when the people of the United States of America could, in the words of Thomas Jefferson, assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and nature God entitles them. Tom Straw also reminded us it would take another six years before George Washington would become our nation's first president in 1789. In those early years, as a nation, there was an overwhelming sense of community and country. Here in New Harmony, that sense has never faltered. The Harmonist, all German immigrants, held the 4th of July as significant to their community. Ironically, when George Rapp came to the Baltimore docks to greet his vanguard of followers, it was the 4th of July, 1804. Not surprisingly, Baltimore was celebrating. Speaking no English, they could have interpreted all of the commotion as a tribute to their safe arrival from a very troubled year. <laughs> Recognition of the 4th of July was continued by the Owen McClure movement. Robert Owen, with him speaking in New Harmony on July 4th, 1826, and his son William making two presentations in subsequent years. Robert Owen's presentation was titled an oration containing a declaration of mental independence. <laughs> I can assure you it was a much longer oration than this one. <laughs> today we celebrate the past, but we also celebrate who we are today. Some of us who are gathered here were born here or near here and have stayed here and love this town. Some of us from afar discovered New Harmony and also fell in love with this very special place. What brings us all together today is our common love of our country and of this unique community. We are celebrating that re reality at this very moment. When I look back on the founding of New Harmony by George Rapp and Frederick Rapp, I realized that they were visionary leaders, but they would not have accomplished anything if they hadn't had 800 followers to execute their vision. The followers worked from sunup to sundown and ate five times a day, 6 a.m., 9 a.m., noon, 3 p.m., and 6 p.m. Robert Owen was a visionary leader with a grand vision but he brought with him five major followers in his four sons and daughter who stayed in New Harmony far beyond 1827, contributing to America at the local, state, and national levels. 
William McClure was a visionary leader, but he brought to New Harmony educators, artists, scientists, and progressive thinkers. A boatload of the top professionals from the Academy of Natural Sciences in Philadelphia. Thomas Say, Charles Alexander Lesseur, Marie Frédégé, to name a few. Nationally and internationally recognized individuals who left Philadelphia, America's intellectual capital, and who believed enough in William McClure's vision and followed him into the wilderness of New Harmony. Together they attracted others, like Francis Wright, who was a friend and mentor of the Marquis de Lafayette, was a publisher and writer from New Harmony to New York. She was a woman ahead of her time. She was on the cutting edge of the abolition of slavery and equal rights for women. The time in New Harmony between 1827 and 1940 was also remarkable for a town of its size. The lines between visionary leaders and those who accomplished those visions began to blur. To simplify the titles, you have leaders and you have doers. Le leaders are doers. <coughs> And doers are leaders, <clears throat> such as John and Jacob Schnee, John and Josephine Elliott, John Beale, the Golden Family Troop, John Robert, Thomas Mumford, Eugene Thrall, Dr. Edward and Sophia Murphy, Mary Fauntleroy, the New Harmony Memorial Commission, Don Blair, and recently, the RGRG students of the New Harmony School, which led the restoration of the Robert Gym. The Harmonists built 180 structures in 10 years. 25 remain, and 18 of those are private residences. Surviving commercial and exhibition structures are Dormitory 2, the Granary, the Wolf House, the Lentz House, the Fauntleroy House, the Neve House, to name a few. From the Owen McClure period, we have three original structures. The 1830 House, built by the Owen brothers. The former Arbor House, which is soon to become Lowry Hollow. And the David Dale Owen Laboratory. One might also count the Owen McClure residence which Alexander McClure, William McClure's brother, immediately rebuilt after the fire of 1844. From, 1927, from 1827 to 1940, we have the Rabir Gym, the Working Men's Institute, most of the structures on Main Street, Murphy Auditorium, the Thralls Opera House, and the New Harmony Bridge became a reality. Then came Kenneth and Jane Blaffer Owen, where their efforts spanned 60 years. Jane Owen revived the Harmonist spiritual landscape and endowed it with her own vision. The Robert Lee Blaffer Foundation was established in 1950. The Rufus Church was built in 1960. The New Harmony Inn and the Red Geranium Restaurant were launched in 1974. Eli Lilly joined the effort through the Lilly Endowment after Historic New Harmony, Inc., a 501c3 not-for-profit, was created in 1971 and heavily invested in this town. Between 1972 and 1986, 14 years, the endowment granted over $15 million to Historic New Harmony, Inc. Others contributed. Governor Brannigan and the state of Indiana joined in. The 4,000-acre Harmony Park was created. By 1975, over $24 million had been invested in New Harmony. Through the efforts of the Robert Lee Blaffer Foundation, 11 structures were built or restored, including the George McLeod Barn Abbey, the Barrett Gatehouse, the Owen Community House, the Rufus Church, and the Sarah Campbell Pottery Studio, to name a few. 
In addition came six gardens, including Tillich Park, Carroll's Garden of Life, and the Cathedral Labyrinth and Sacred Garden among them. Also, five fountains, 22 sculptures, most notably Jacques Lipsch's Descent of the Holy Spirit and James Rosati's Bust of Paul Tillich. One of the most significant physical events occurred in 2000 when the New Harmony Bypass was completed. Can you imagine today all of those trucks which go by our town had to come into the corner of Maine and church and turn, take turns turning? My God, it would be awful. <laughs> Okay, so outside of all of this activity, um, private citizens were buying, renovating, and restoring commercial structures and private residences. So it's apparent since the beginning of New Harmony, we have had a multitude of leaders and doers. As I look out into this audience, I see an auditorium brimming with leaders and doers. As a community, we have been left with an enormous social legacy, which has given us an unmatched physical presence. New Harmony has nine major venues, any one of which would be the envy of many larger towns. They were created and retained by an incredible group of leaders and doers. These many efforts have literally attracted visitors from around the world. Yes, we are a significant global heritage tourism destination, but we are still a living community, and we want to keep it that way. So all of this brings us to the moment. It's up to all of us to find a way through continued dedicated leadership and hard work to sustain, protect, and enhance this amazing place we call home and to move it forward into the future. How do we achieve excellence and remain small? How do we advance this very special community while surrounded by a world that is striving on bigness, greed, and speed. In 1976, Jane Owen had a guest room dedicated by the Reverend George McLeod from Iona Abbey, Scotland. And his dedication prayer was, Lord Christ, with you there is no distance of space or time. You are above us and beneath us, before us and behind us, within us and between us. So we ask further to build this house so that its very atmosphere inspires faith in its changing residence, engenders hope, and its fellowship breeds love. And we asked you to build a commune around it, a city, obedient, courageous, and cooperative, vibrant with the sound of a new harmony, where the old may find comfort, the middle-aged recover vision, and the young find courage. So on this day of celebration, let us be grateful for those who have come before us and for those leaders and doers who are here among us today. Let us give thanks for our many individual blessings and may the United States of America and the town of New Harmony be forever blessed. Thank you.
Thank you so much to the choir. It was very nice to hear today. Thank you. And again, thank you, Mr. Schutte, for those wonderful words. Thank you. I would like to now uh, invite Carol Scarfia to the podium to present the Kiwanis and Tri Kappa Volunteer Award. When looking around New Harmony, many people of all ages are watched as they do various duties to improve the look of our town, help neighbors in need, keep organizations growing, and just being there when needed as a helpful individual. We had great nominations made, and the decision was difficult, and all persons nominated are truly seen throughout the community wearing many hats. But today we can only honor one individual. And as Kent said, this person is a doer and a leader, because you're going to hear. This individual is a president of Ford Home Board of Directors, president-elect for Posey County Retired Educators, past president of New Harmony Kiwanis, past president of the Garden Club of New Harmony, second vice president for United Way of Posey County, co-director of the New Harmony Food Pantry, Playtopia Playground Committee, Bicentennial Commission in 2014, Garden Club Coordinator, Red, Redbud Park Improvement, New Harmony Ministry Association Board, Johnson United Methodist Church, Lay Delegate to Annual Conference, Church Council and Trustee, Plein Air Paint Out, Art Sale Co-Chair and Food Delivery Coordinator, Kuntzfest Volunteer, Multiple Organizations, U.S. Postal Service New Harmony Annual Food Collection Coordinator, Spring Art Festival New Harmony Volunteer, New Harmony Theater Usher, WMI Book Sale Volunteer, Election Poll Worker in New Harmony, New Harmony Community Choir, and Mesker Park Zoo Docent. It is with great pleasure that I present to you at this time New Harmony's 2022 Outstanding Community Volunteer, Paul Allison. His name will go on the plaque at the Ribert Gym for the volunteers. And as I look out here, I see a lot of past uh, volunteers of the year. And he has a gift certificate to the Red Geranium and a declaration. You're very, very welcome. I think after hearing that laugh, uh, list, I'm going to go home and take it down. <laughs> But, you know, Kent had a wonderful speech, and New Harmony is a community of volunteers. A good example of that is Kent, Tom Stahl, and I are in Kiwanis, so we'll be going over to the park to host the picnic. Tuesday, we'll be grabbing our tools and garden for the garden club and drink coffee at the Black Lodge. <laughs> and then the third Thursday of the month, we'll all be at the food pantry. So New Harmony operates on volunteers, and that what is part of what keeps New Harmony special. So thank you t for this honor, and I'm glad to join those that have received it before and those that will deserve it in the future, because there are many people in this town that are deserving of this award. Thank you.
Let's close with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we come before you, hearts full of blessing and thanksgiving, and we just want to be reminded this morning, God, that you love us so much and have set us free with true freedom. And Lord, that you encourage us and call us to love one another and exhibit acts of love and encouragement to gather one another up. And Lord, we'd ask that you would bless these conversations that are happening today and bless each one of us here this afternoon. We praise you and we honor you, and we pray all these things in your holy and gracious name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Bryce. This concludes our program this morning. Thank you to all who have made this possible, from Christine and Historic New Harmony to the Friends of the Working Men's Institute who uh, helped coordinate this uh, program, to, again, to our wonderful speakers and volunteers who do things that keep this community alive. So thank you very much. It's my understanding the golf cart parade will begin shortly and followed by the picnic in McClure Park. So enjoy the rest of your 4th of July. Thank you very much.